welcome. Please keep introducing yourselves in the chat. And, um, I look forward to hearing more from all of you. Um, my name is Namal De Silva. I'm the Chief Diversity Officer for American Bird Conservancy. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, this series, Birdability Birders, is co-hosted by American Bird Conservancy and Birdability, and we intend to support birders with disabilities and other health concerns. A little about our two organizations. American Bird Conservancy works with many partners throughout the Americas. Uh, we work on halting extinctions, um, safeguarding habitats for birds, and building capacity for bird conservation. We want more people to enjoy and care for birds and the environment, including people who have been historically ignored within the conservation field. Um, that's why it's such a pleasure to be here today. Birdability uses education, outreach, and advocacy to make the birding community and the outdoors more welcoming, inclusive, safe and accessible for everybody. We hope that these webinars will illuminate the perspectives, needs and aspirations of birders with a diversity of disabilities and other health concerns, including birders who are neurodivergent. Our guest today is Carrie Sesportas, an autistic birder with a lifelong passion for animals and nature. Carrie, whose pronouns are she, they, saw a pyrux, I'm going to mess up this bird name. I'm sorry. It's Pyroloxia. I should have asked earlier, but I did look up the bird. It's a desert cardinal. Um, in, in 1997, Carrie saw this bird while serving as an AmeriCorps volunteer at Guadalupe Mountains National Park in Texas. This was the beginning of their passion for birds. In 2015, Carrie was certified as a master naturalist by the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge in Massachusetts. Carrie has been a member of Mass Audubon since 2002 and avidly contributes to eBird, adding to their life list while also furthering citizen science. I love the connections between um, furthering your own birding and also contributing to birds and bird conservation and bird science. Carrie advocates for greater understanding and inclusion of neurodivergent individuals in natural spaces and birding communities. Our co-host today is Fre Freya McGregor, who is the Birdability Coordinator and serves as the interviewer for all six of these webinars. Freya is an occupational therapist and her experience with modifying physical and cultural environments, adapting tasks and equipment to enable participation and developing public health programs helps to guide Birdability's overall approach. Her background is in blindness and low vision services. Um, welcome to all of you. I'm excited to learn from Carrie um, and Freya and Happy New Year to all of you. I'm gonna turn it over to Freya. Thanks, Namal. Hi, everybody. My name's Freya McGregor. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm really excited to be here with you tonight. Um, again, big thanks to Namal, Erica, and the folks at the American Bird Conservancy for partnering with us in this series of webinars. If you haven't seen the last three episodes, they're all up um, both on the American Bird Conservancy and the Birdability YouTube channels. Uh, so do check them out if you haven't. And there's two more coming up after today. Uh, so uh, we look forward to um, seeing you at those as well. Um, tonight I'm coming, oh, it's actually morning where I am, I'm coming to you from the land of the Wurundjeri people, which is now known as Melbourne, Australia. It's actually Wednesday morning for me. Um, Zoom is an amazing thing. Uh, and the Wurundjeri people have been enjoying the birds here for more than 40,000 years, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, as we're getting started, um, if you haven't introduced yourself in the chat, um, please go ahead. It's really fun to see where everyone's coming from. Um, if you have a disability or another health concern, particularly um, if you're autistic, um, we'd love to hear from you. If you wanted to share, don't feel obliged, but if you'd like to share some of your experiences in the chat um, so that others can learn um, as well. And there's a survey at the end of this webinar. So if, if you're autistic, we'd really love to hear from you um, in that little survey. We'll use the answers anonymously to help create more resources for the Birdability website um, to make um, birding more accessible and inclusive um, for, for folks with autism. Freya, I forgot to um, do two little, two, three more introductions. I'm so sorry. Um, I wanted to mention to everyone that we have two American Sign Language interpreters with us today. Um, we have Paula and Kathy. They are both um, on, on screen. Um, they will alternate 
and provide live sign language interpretation. We also have um, closed captioning. Um, there is the CC button on your um, screen at the bottom. And finally, Erica is providing support in the background and will also be available in the chat. Um, thank you to all three of you as well. And I'll turn it back over to Freya. Yeah, so um, <laughs> Erica, thanks Erica, thanks Damal. Um, and yes, uh, two American Sign Language interpreters. Um, they're an additional cost for programs, but um, this is something that we want to encourage you if you're involved in any program creation that sometimes things like sign language interpreters um, providing honorariums to our guests uh, or people who um, make presentations to you. These are, these are additional programming costs that help contribute to equity um, and uh, inclusion. So if you just budget for them, they're not really an additional cost. It's just part of, part of the process. Um, so throughout this series, we're going to hear from a really interesting, amazing group of um, birders with lots of different stories and lots of different experiences. But it's important to remember that disability is diverse and each uh, disability or health concern is diverse within the same diagnosis. And every person may experience their um, access challenges in a different way every day or within a day. So um, the views that are expressed in this series are only those of the person that we're speaking to. We're not making any claim that um, they cover every person's experience. And, uh, and we encourage you to consider whose voices are not being heard in the series uh, and how you might work to ensure that their voices are uh, included and their experiences are included in your programming or in your everyday life. Um, finally, um, Please um, just keep the chat respectful and kind. Um, we want this to be a safe place. The Burden community is an in-person community. It's also a, a virtual community and we wanna make sure that this Zoom is a safe uh, and comfortable space for everyone who's here tonight and, um, and for Carrie and, and myself and, and the people behind the scenes as well. So finally, if you're new to Vertability, um, please check out our website, vertability.org. We're a new nonprofit. We're nearly a year old, um, two weeks away from our first birthday. And uh, there's lots of information up there about um, how to help make um, birding and birding locations more accessible, physically accessible, and more inclusive and welcoming um, to people with disabilities and other health concerns. So vertability.org. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at Vertability as well. So let's get into it. Carrie, um, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, please go ahead and introduce yourself um, with perhaps your names, your pronouns, uh, where you are, uh, and um, what your access challenge is. Sure. Um, thanks, Freya. And, and I wanted to thank Birdability and the American Bird Conservancy for having me. And I wanted to wish everyone a happy new year. Um, my name is Carrie Susportis. Um, I am uh, located near the Boston area in Massachusetts. Um, this is traditionally sovereign land of the Massachusetts and Pawtucket people. And I did want to provide an acknowledgement to their stewardship over the years. And um, my access challenges, um, I'm autistic and I intentionally use identity first language, uh, which is, um, when I describe myself on the autism spectrum, I'm going to say that I'm autistic as opposed to a person with autism. Um, we can talk a bit about, about language and terminology and things like that later um, and how I identify. Um, I'm also part of the LGBT community and um, I use she or they pronouns. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. And Carrie is one of our birdability captains who are our volunteers who work within the local community to help uh, ensure that birding truly is for everybody. So I've had the great pleasure of learning from Carrie for the last year or so um, in various ways. So um, I'm excited to um, keep learning tonight and, um, and keep learning after tonight, I'm sure as well. Um, so, Kerry, how did you first get into birds and birding? Uh, we heard about a paraloxia, um, a very tongue twister of a word. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about, about how you started um, as a birder. Sure. And, and I know you asked me to keep these questions kind of, I mean, the response is kind of short. Um, for me, getting into birds and birding has been kind of a process and it's, it's been um, over 
over half of my lifetime. So I'll try to keep it simple. I'll try to keep it short. But yeah, basically, um, I love animals. I always have. I've always identified very closely with all creatures. Um, birds have often captured my interest, but I really started seriously looking at birds. Uh, I would say about, this is aging me, 25, 26, 27 years ago. Um, when uh, I was in college, I um, had a roommate who had a lot of field trips and some for environmental science and biology courses. And uh, I was in a different major, but she was telling me about all these cool field trips that she was going on. And I went to college in the Midwest. And so we were near um, Lake Erie, which was a really wonderful place for watching birds. So that kind of sparked my interest right there. When I graduated college, I did two years of AmeriCorps, which is um, a national um, service program. And um, my first year I was stationed in Washington State uh, along the Columbia River Gorge. And I, I should say, I grew up on the East Coast. I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, and we had blue jays there. Uh, but in Washington was my first time seeing a Stellar's Jay. And so I thought, well, that's cool. It's kind of a blue jay, but it's kind of different. And the, the following year, I was um, working at Guadalupe Mountains National Park, and that's in Western Texas. It's north of El Paso. It's just south of the border with the state of New Mexico and near Carlsbad Caverns National Park as well. And there are Pyroloxia out there. And again, I grew up with cardinals and these were like cardinal looking birds, but they were just so cool because they weren't cardinals and really um, interesting color. And so I just started paying probably more attention to the birds than I was to the actual work that I was doing, which was watershed restoration and trail building at the time. But um, shortly after AmeriCorps, I moved to the Boston area, um, joined Mass Audubon and been birding ever since. So it's been about 20 years. That's awesome. And I love that you sort of knew what was going on with, with the birds you were used to, but it was the birds that were just slightly different that really kind of caught your eye and like that's that's where it went. That's awesome. Um, there's there's so many joys of birding. Um, what What are the top three maybe things that birding and birds have brought to you? Um, yeah, it's hard to limit it to three. Um, but I, I would say the biggest thing that birds have brought to me is um, really patience and, and grounding and mindfulness. Um, when I'm out birding, I'm fully present. Um, and, and that's a really good thing given kind of the access challenges and the stresses of daily life. So when I'm birding, it's, it, I'm really in my happy place. And um, birds are fascinating and wonderful creatures. Um, they're so there's a lot to learn and, and that's both humbling, but it's, a, it's also a challenge. And so just, just the wide variety of species, but also what connects them too. Um, there's just, there's always so much to learn. And even if I identify a species, I might not, like if I know what the male looks like in breeding plumage, I might not know what the female looks like, or I might not know what a juvenile looks like or a second year molt or something like that. So there's always like a depth to it or different layers um, that that just um, it, it's a hook to keep me engaged. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that about birding too. There's always more to learn. No one knows everything about birds because as humanity as a whole doesn't know everything about birds. So it's such an interesting um, thing to be interested in. Um, I'm just sticking a link in the chat, folks. There's a page on our website about mindful birding and Carrie just sort of mentioned the, the peace and the meditation. So um, I just thought that might be of interest to folks um, in the chat. So check it out. There's a couple of resources and things on that on that page. Um, and Carrie, historically, there's been a bit of an image of, of birding involving walking down a trail and checking birds off a list. And I know you contribute to eBird. I also am a lister, um, but it's not the only way I bird. And there's lots of different ways to enjoy birds. It doesn't even have to involve looking. So how do you go birding? Um, yeah, thanks, Freya. And, and I'm also going to cheat a little bit because I, I didn't, I forgot to add the third thing on my top three oh, in the sorry. last question, but this ties in. Um, so this, this is good. Um, it, it, one of the things that I really love about birds are um, just that, that like sense, it, it's very engaging to my senses. 
um, which is a really cool thing for an autistic person because sometimes we seek sensory stimulation, sometimes it's overwhelming, but with birds, it's, it's like perfect. Their, their colors, their song, their calls, like there's, there's their habitat, there's always something interesting. And, and how I go birding is, is probably, I would say it's holistic because I'm, I'm thinking about all of those things and, and all of those things go into identification as well. And um, yeah, it kind of satisfies like, you know, sometimes I'll just go out birding because I want to see who's there. It, it, it's kind of like being nosy and I want to see who's around the neighborhood, right? Where are my friends? Um, and, and I did that this afternoon during my lunch hour. I went down to the local pond and there were like 37 common mergansers and I thought that was super cool. So I just went down and said hi. So that's that's like one birding outing. But um, other times like I'm a little more, I, I would say serious about it. I've got my eBird app open. Um, I've, I've recently got into photography. So I'll take photos and post those to eBird as well. Um, I'm potentially going to look into getting some sound recording equipment. So there's like, there's deeper, deeper levels, but um, for the most part, I just, I'm curious and I wanna see who's around. And, and I'll go out with expectations also if I've seen um, other people's checklists to see who's been seen around, or if I have a target bird in mind, I might go seek that out. And I'm in Massachusetts right now and the stellar sea eagle has really captured a lot of attention and sad to say that I was working when it was in Massachusetts, so I didn't get to see it, but it's been in Maine recently. I don't think it was sighted today, but um, that, that was really exciting to the birding community here. So I, I would say that it, it's, it's always something that's interesting or engaging. Um, for me, it's, um, it helps me forget about other challenges. And, and so it's a bit of a distraction, but it also satisfies kind of like, I don't know, it, it's kind of like Pokemon for adults. And I know other people have said that, but it's kind of like, you gotta collect them all. You've got to see them all. Um, and, and it's not like I'm, I'm serious, like, um, like I need a life bird list that's like super long or something like that, but it, it's kind of like all of those things. And I don't know how to describe it, but it just seems to satisfy all my curiosity. That's beautiful. That's amazing. Yeah. I, and my birding style is a lot like yours where sometimes it's just hanging out with whoever's around and just being glad to be in the company of these small things that fly. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it's more a bit like, Ooh, Ooh, that's a new bird. I'm, I'm really excited about that new bird that I've never run into before. Um, not, no way of going birding is more or less valuable than any other. And, and everyone does it differently and might do it differently on different days, which is another really cool thing about birds and birding. So um, turning a little bit to autism. So can you tell us a little bit more about autism and about being autistic? And um, what sort of activities does it make challenging for you in your everyday life? Yeah, everyday life with autism, um, I, I will say it's, it's a, a dynamic disability. And what I mean by that is I'll have good days and I'll have challenging days. Um, sometimes that depends on what else is going on in my life and, and stress levels or anxiety. Sometimes that depends on the physical environment. So if it's rainy and cold and yucky, um, sometimes it depends on something sensory, if there's something um, bothering me, like, you know, the clothing that I'm wearing doesn't feel right or doesn't fit right. So it really does depend. Um, sometimes it depends on challenges I'm having in interpersonal communication. But what I can say in general, in terms of access challenges, um, for me, I have um, an auditory processing disorder that is, is part of the autism. It was diagnosed separately from an, um, by an audiologist, but Basically, it's part of, um, for me, the, the neurological package of being autistic in that um, I rely on closed captions. Um, and, and that's a hard thing for people to understand that, um, you know, I, I am hearing um, sound um, and I can locate sound, but when people are talking, I'm a lot slower to follow along. Um, and so I, I rely on closed captions completely. Uh, and when they're not available or when written material isn't available, um, it, it's very challenging and it can be very frustrating. 
Um, so that's that's one thing I wanted to talk about. And then the other relates to the social environment. Um, and, and this could be anything from you know, social anxiety to um, just feeling very shut down or very quiet um, or needing space. Um, sometimes it can relate to um, like noise or excess light and things like that will really bother me. Um, I always have noise canceling headphones with me and pretty much wear them anytime I'm not birding. Um, so that's one of the one of the things I do to accommodate myself. And um, yeah, I, I it, it really it really can depend. Um, but everyday life, um, it, it can be a challenge. Um, and, and that's why I do consider it a disability. It's it's also an identity. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, things like, um, you know, if something's, I would say I get tired a lot. So exhaustion is part of the package as well. Um, so I may spend like a day at work just really trying to hide some of the challenges that I have, even if I've disclosed, like people aren't necessarily completely understanding um, or I'm not getting closed captions or not getting some sort of accommodation that I've requested. And it can be exhausting to kind of hide like your internal reaction to that, or the disappointment. And so uh, fatigue is a big part of it as well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, before I ask you another question about that, um, because you mentioned headphones, um, another one of our wonderful vertibility captains, Nicole, is also autistic and she wrote a blog for us um, a few months ago and I'm just gonna put that link in the chat. And she uses noise cancelling headphones to go birding um, because a lot of birds are too noisy and it's too much. And so the noise, wearing noise cancelling headphones allows her to go out and enjoy birds. So um, different people, different experiences, different needs, but um, folks, if you're interested, um, have a look at that, um, that blog because it, it explains it really, really well, um, how, how folks who don't have these sensory sensitivities might think, why is someone wearing headphones when you're out in the woods? You're blocking it all out, but actually for Nicole, it's the thing that allows her to be there and enjoy the birds. Um, Carrie, when we were talking earlier, um, you were explaining to me about your auditory processing um, disorder and how um, you have, you, you think in, is this right? You think in images. And so first you have to translate the images into words. That's one thing. And then the second part is getting the words out of your mouth. And they're both quite an effort. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Um... It's, it, for me, it's both um, processing speech and producing it. Um, they're, they're a little different. So in terms of processing what's going on, um, depending on the number of speakers, it can get really overwhelming and, and I'll fall really behind in a conversation. Um, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, it might be a little better. Um, but in terms of speaking, um, speaking verbally is actually very difficult for me, and it, it's something that I do because um, it's largely been expected, um, or that's, um, you know, traditionally growing up, and, and I'm a little bit older, and so, um, you know, I was mostly forced to, to talk, even though I started talking quite late. Um, I could read and write before I could talk. Um, it, it, the difficulty for me, and, and maybe maybe an analogy is, is, is helpful. Um, it, it's like learning to read music and learning to play an instrument. Um, so first you have to understand the notes that you're reading. Um, and that's like a language in itself. And then you have to translate those by locating the positions on the instrument and actually playing it. And so for me, it's like a multi-step process to, I, I think visually. Um, so I see things. And for me to communicate it, it's like, okay, well, I have this picture. How do I say it? What are the words? Now I got to produce these words. Um, I'm tired. I'm out of breath, that kind of thing. And so it's really production, actually, for me to talk. I, um, when, when I'm not working, when I'm not um, like in conversation with somebody, or if it's people I know well, I'm going to text. I, I don't talk on the phone. I don't 
um, you know, unless I'm required to, it's it's going to be a written form of communication, email or text. Um, but if it's something I have to do, um, then I will talk. It's exhausting and it's it's slow for me. And and sometimes I'm not coming up with the right words, so I might either mispronounce something or say a word that's analogous but means something different. Um, so it, it can be a challenge. And then someone will repeat back to me, well, you said this. And I'm like, I absolutely did not. And they're like, well, write down what you were thinking. I write it down. It, it's what I thought I said. Yeah. So, so people, um, I'm thinking of folks, ways people can be more inclusive um, is maybe giving you the opportunity to write instead of speak. Or um, I know we were talking about before, um, providing you with handouts or, or other visual information, not forcing you to listen only to, to absorb information or um, even just being a bit more patient with, with when, you're, when you're speaking, giving you time to kind of um, get it out or, or an alternative way. And um, I know a lot of folks um, who are autistic uh, use augmentative alternative communication devices where maybe they type and, and the little computer speaks out what, what's being um, communicated instead of the person having to do the speaking direct, like verbally, um, which is an, another really awesome um, tool. Um, a couple of people, I just, I, it's really hard for me to follow the chat during these, but I just saw two pop up people saying thank you for doing this webinar because, as you just explained, it's so difficult. Um, so, a couple of people thanking you, and, and I thank you again for for this. Um, all right, so speaking, we were talking about language a little bit earlier, we sort of hinted at it, um, and language is always evolving and different people identify in different ways and how someone identifies um, can't be wrong. You can't say someone's doing it wrong, they, they can, people are allowed to identify however they like. But um, one word that um, is cha has changed quite a lot is um, the word handicapped. And this, there's this idea that disabled um, is not polite. Some people think this, but what what do you think? What do you identify as disabled? And and does does disability mean something to you, or is it offensive? How do you feel about those words? Um, I guess I'll tackle this in parts. Um, I identify as disabled, and when I say that, some people will correct me and say, "Well, no, you're supposed to say person with a disability." And, and I get that too when I say I'm autistic and they're like, well, you're a person with autism or you're on the autism spectrum. And usually when I'm being corrected, it's by someone who thinks they know the politically correct thing to say. Um, but what they may not realize is that, I mean, disability isn't a bad word. Um, it's not a bad word for me. In fact, when people go out of their way to ignore disability, even, even if I disclose and I say, I'm autistic or I'm on the autism spectrum and someone says, well, um, I wouldn't have known or we'll get to this a bit later. I mean, we have a couple of like things that we'll talk about, but um, it can be a bit discounting of the experience that I have. And, and so for me, like I, I don't have a disability that's very obvious physically. Um, it, it can become apparent if I'm talking to someone and I'm not keeping up or I'm just I'm having trouble or I'm having like a meltdown or a shutdown or something like that, then it becomes clear that something's different. Um, but it's not, it, it, I would consider it an invisible disability, at least on the surface. Um, but I want people to see the disability and, and, and not because I want like a lot of questions, I don't mind them, but mostly because I think that we have to talk about these things. We have to talk about our differences in order to understand them. And if you say you don't see disability, then you're not seeing me. And, and I think that's similar with other marginalized groups. Um, and, and, and so I guess I, I, don't, I don't separate me as a person from the disability. It, it's me, it is my experience. Um, with autism, it gets a little more fraught too, I think, because historically there's been a big push um, largely by, by parents and guardians in the medical community to look for a cure. And I, and I think what that does is that ignores that 
autism is a, a lifelong disability. And so people focus on autistic kids, but kids don't grow out of it. We become adults. And when we're adults, there are no services for us. And so I really think by ignoring the disability, um, by kind of putting that aside and saying, well, you're a person first, um, it means that I'm not getting the accommodations and the services and the recognition um, of, of some of the challenges that I need. And, and so, and then it, with the autism community as well, and we could talk about this too, there's other terminology that autistic people use, um, like neurodivergent. I, I could also say that I'm neurodivergent. Um, some people use the term neurodiverse. Um, neurodiversity really um, refers to a larger um, kind of category of neurological conditions. So that might include like dyslexia and dyspraxia, um, ADD, ADHD, um, in addition to autism. So those, those are some other, I guess, terminology, but I, I probably went well beyond what your original question was. And no, I'm no, happy I, I think to answer it, questions if people have them. Yeah, no, thank you, Carrie. It's, it's language is really important. And I think a lot of people who are trying to be well-meaning don't want to do the wrong thing, but they can make things really awkward if they're just avoiding something that's totally okay to say, like you have a disability, like that's fine. That's not, it's only, disability is only a dirty word if there's a problem with it and there isn't a problem with it. So why should we not use this word? Um, neurodivergent too, if folks are listening who aren't sure, if someone doesn't have autism or ADHD or dyspraxia, or, um, neurotypical is the is the other word that that um, other folks might might fall into the category of. Um, I'm, I'm neurotypical um, and other folks are neurodivergent and it's a beautiful thing and it's a normal part of the diversity of humans like how cool is this that different people's brains operate in different ways it's it's really awesome um, and you touched on earlier too about identity first language that you're autistic you, you say I'm autistic rather than I'm a person with autism although there's some certainly there's some folks um, some disability um, some disabilities where people may want to say person first language, like I'm a person who uses a wheelchair. Um, you know, different different groups of people have different preferences, and different individuals have different preferences. But yeah, I think I think it's not okay for someone to tell you you're you're identifying yourself wrongly. Like that's not right. Like you can call yourself whatever you would like to call yourself <laughs> for sure. Like that's bizarre. I've, um, I've had this conversation with a lot of people and, and um, sometimes people will follow up with questions. Well, what should I say? And it, especially if they're not sure, um, because my, you know, my perspective is my perspective. So someone else who's autistic might feel differently, might use other terminology or someone else who's disabled might use other terminology. So I guess the best thing for someone who's uncertain what to say um, is to ask the person that they're interacting with, what terminology do you use? Um, because that, that gives them sort of the space to um, explain how they identify and what language they use. Sure, yeah, perfect, thank you. Um, and you mentioned accommodations too. So rather than thinking of houses and uh, hotels and things, uh, in the context of autism and disability, what what are accommodations and what kind of accommodations do you benefit from? Um, you mentioned captions um, that, that help you participate in birding related activities like programs at a nature center or bird outings or webinars. What, what, are, what are some of the accommodations that, that you need? Yeah, so I, I've given this some thought and definitely captions are a must for, for me, um, for, for my disability. Um, if captions aren't possible, um, like we're, we're lucky with Zoom and with other virtual meeting platform technology that um, even if there's not a third party typing um, captions, the auto captioning is pretty good and, and that's free. That's just something that the host of a meeting can turn on in their account. And that way someone doesn't have to request it. Um, and, and that's part of being um, inclusive also is instead of waiting for someone to come to you to request it, um, being inclusive, you might advertise a meeting and say closed captions available um, because that signifies to a broader audience that 
they're going to feel at home there. They're going to be included. Um, I would say another thing for me, autistic people tend to have a, a lot of anxiety about things that we can't control or things we just don't know, uncertainty or surprises. And, and I think, um, you know, certainly, especially going out in the field, there are going to be surprises, conditions change and things like that. Um, but what, a, a, like a trip leader or um, uh, even an educational program, I think what can be provided is ahead of time, a lot of information. Um, because that way, and so, so for me, um, being autistic, what I really like is like a written narrative, where we're going, maybe a map, um, maybe a field list of the birds we'd expect to see, maybe photographs that someone's taken on a previous outing, um, expectations about you know, what we anticipate the weather could be at that time of year, um, how to dress, so um, you know how to prepare for the elements essentially. So these, rather than um, be asked questions, um, it, it anticipates a need that somebody might have, and it might be helpful to other people too, not just an autistic person, to have that level of information in order to prepare. Um, one of the things I tend to do um, because I'd like to become comfortable and familiar with a place first is if I'm planning on going on an outing, I might sketch it out on my own ahead of time um, and just kind of get a sense of the lay of the land like where the restrooms are um, and, and you know, what the conditions are um, so that I know that I can make the pre preparations I need to be comfortable. Um, and then any, I guess, any written materials ahead of time, and I, I think I've just mentioned that, but also post-trip, um, like providing folks with your email address in case there are follow-up questions or exchanging, um, eBird usernames so you can exchange checklists or if anyone's taking photos, sharing those with the group. Things like that are really helpful, I think both from an engagement perspective, but also in kind of consolidating the information or remembering the trip and answering questions. Um, and I think for me being on the spectrum, I'm like a sponge for knowledge. So any information is good information. That might not be true. It might be overwhelming for someone else, um, but maybe make the information available in a way that, well, if someone wants to look at it, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. Thank you. Yeah, really awesome. And there's a bit of a conversation going on in the chat right now about um, folks wanting to know this kind of detailed information ahead of, of outings. Um, here's another link for you all. There's um, a page on our website about writing bird outing event descriptions. Um, most adding event descriptions I've seen are generally very brief and very general um, and not very specific. Um, and so there's more information on that web page about the detail that's really helpful for a lot of different folks with different disabilities and um, adding a map, I need to go in and edit that web page. Kerry, thank you for um, adding that. And um, yeah, lots more detail about things. There's also, by the way, folks, the birdability map. If you haven't heard about this, um, we do this with National Audubon. It's a really cool, um, tool. Uh, anyone can contribute to it. It's a survey and it just asks you to tell us what is at this location, um, how accessible it is, but you don't have to make judgment calls, just tell us what's there. Uh, and things like I saw someone in the chat mention parking fees and parking, that's in there. Um, that's in the birdability site review. So if you'd like to know more about the birdability map, I just put that uh, link in the chat as well. And um, it's a great way to Adding to it is a really wonderful thing and it creates a resource for a lot of different folks um, to find the information that they need to feel comfortable going out to, to a new birding location. Um, so you mentioned before, Carrie, that um, autism is often thought of as a childhood condition, but there are plenty of autistic adults. Um, rather than focusing only on programs for children with autism, What's the best way for the birding community to engage and interact with all autistic birders? Yeah, um, I, I'm really vocal about um, basically spreading awareness and understanding of the fact that uh, autism is a lifelong developmental disability um, and children don't, um, as adults, become non-autistic we become autistic adults. 
Um, and so I think it's important that if you're focusing on the autism community or you wanna provide for autistic people um, that you not just focus on children, um, that you also think about what autistic adults might need. Um, and that's, that's gonna look different too. Um, and, and there might be different accommodations that are needed. Um, but I guess, yeah, I just, I think it's really important. Um, a lot of programming for autistic children, I think is driven by, um, actually I, should, I should, shouldn't speak so generally, but I've seen programming that's kind of coming from a model that's um, like a special education model or um, driven by um, people in um, kind of allied health professions and things like that. And that's, um, you know, certainly informed by a certain mindset, but I think it's equally important to um, ask autistic people um, what suggestions they have, what they think, um, because there might be blind spots. We might see something um, in a proposed educational program and say, no, it's not going to work. And we can explain why. Uh, or we might see something and say, um, you know, this, this is a good idea. And, and we think you might want to build on that. So I think using us as experts on our disability, I think is in, um, you know, the best way to design programming for autistic people of all ages. Yeah, right. Be, letting people be the experts on themselves. Um, absolutely. And programming, I know that some places have like sensory friendly programming where um, maybe there's less sound, maybe there's less people allowed into the nature center that day, or um, it's a bit darker in that room, or um, maybe they have, I know there's some, I know, I know about one open air museum. It's not a birding place so much as a historical, um, you know, old, old houses and stuff, but they have whole sensory friendly days um, that are set up for anyone um, to come along, but specifically for, for autistic folks, kids and adults to enjoy in a, in a way that's a bit more chilled out and not as intense. Um, and that the staff on hand know a bit, have had some training about, about what autism is and how different autistic people might um, communicate and um, what to do if someone's having a meltdown, like how you can help or how you shouldn't help. And um, that, that, that can just be such an awesome, an awesome thing. Um, but yeah, I love your suggestion. I think it applies to a lot of different people rather than telling people, we're going to do this for you, <laughs> inviting them to help build the thing that you want to do together in a more collaborative approach um, will serve everybody better. Um, I would add in there too that providing honorariums for that kind of labor is really important, not expecting people to give up their own time and expertise for free um, <laughs> when you do this, but it's a really awesome thing to do. Um, Carrie, bird conservation will succeed when we include everybody in this work. So what does conservation mean to you? And do you see yourself as a conservationist? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I kind of, um, well, I'll, I'll, I think I'll answer this in two parts. What conservation means to me might not be what it means to science or academia. Um, it, it, to me, it's, if we're talking about bird conservation, it's about the birds. Um, no matter how people enjoy birds or how people engage with birds or how people um, observe birds, it's, it's really about, um, making sure that birds will be there for future generations um, and that we're um, stewarding um, habitat and that we're um, thinking about climate change in, in relation to birds and bird populations and, um, and, and that we're raising awareness. I, I think that's the best thing that birders can do, especially birders, um, who may have a passion um, for birding as a hobby, but may not be scientists. Um, because for me, the connotation of the word conservation or conservationist has kind of an academic or, or um, like uh, you need a master's or a PhD to be able to do that work. And, and to me, I, I think conservation is about everyone. It's about everyone 
having access to the things in nature that um, that we enjoy um, and preserving that for other generations. So I think in that sense, everyone can be a conservationist. Um, just being out there and enjoying birds. Um, I, I've been, I, I live in a fairly dense urban neighborhood, but I've been out, just out in the neighborhood and I'll stop and I'll look up in a tree and other people around will just be like, what are you looking at? And so there's an opportunity. And so that's, to me, that's conservation. It doesn't have to be like in like a, um, you know, an isolated um, natural habitat. It can be, you know, right in our little urban area. Um, and, and I think because there's so many people around and, and, and I give another example. I live near Cambridge, Massachusetts, and there's um, a pond that serves as a reservoir. And there's hooded mergansers there. And I'll go there with some people and just by the fact that there's a group of us and we're stopped and we're looking and some people have cameras, other people are gonna come over, they're curious. And so we could just get a big group of people and they're like, what are you looking at? What is this? I've never seen this before. Um, and, and that is also conservation. So I think we can do it anywhere. It doesn't have to be um, always in nature. Yeah, thank you. And it doesn't have to involve like, being really, really wealthy and being able to donate, you know, millions of dollars for protecting the rainforest or something. You, you, anyone can be involved in conservation. Um, I, I love it. I love the inclusion that that message sends as well. Um, what about, there's there's various bird conservation initiatives that, that anyone can participate in, like installing bird-friendly glass on their homes if they, if they have... Um, trees and vegetation in their backyards and maybe keeping their cat indoors and um, other things like that. Do you, do you participate in any of those types of bird conservation initiatives? And if you do, are there any barriers that impact your participation? And then what would you recommend about trying to remove those barriers? It's a big question. Yeah, it is. And I'm trying to keep it... Um... Yeah, I might have to ask you to repeat some parts of it, but um, in, in terms of, I guess, me participating in conservation efforts, um, for me, where I live, um, it's putting decals on the windows to prevent birds. We get a lot of fledgling robins in the spring, and that's, you know, something I don't want to see is, is a robin hitting a window or any other fledgling or bird hitting a window. And so that's that's something that's simple to do. Um, and I don't, I don't have a cat. Um, I know people who have cats and, and I explain to them why it's not a good idea for them to let their cat outdoors. So for me, I don't have barriers with those sorts of things. Um, but also I think it, some difficulty might be um, with, you know, you don't want to tell someone how to behave. Um, that's probably not the right way to approach it. So maybe a barrier is um, uh, reaching someone in a way that it's not going to feel like um, like they're being told that what they're doing is wrong, but maybe mm -hmm. kind of um, spreading something like a, a good idea or a fun idea, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, something that people can buy into as opposed to um, people being told they're doing it wrong and then um, being turned off by it. Sure, like presenting it like you're welcoming them in to participate rather than you're so naughty, like what are you doing? That, yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so um, we talked about um, disability being diverse and that everybody has so many different experiences um, within disability and within each disability and um, there's also many people uh, everybody um, shares many identities um, I'm a sister I'm a daughter I'm a wife you know um, as well as lots of other things but there's many people share um, multiple historically marginalized identities and uh, or, or just just maybe their gender or their age and um, are there other identities that you um, that you have that impacts your ability to go birding? 
Yeah, and, and we've talked about this, and, and I know I mentioned this briefly in the beginning when I was introducing myself. Um, I am part of the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, I actually serve on my town's Rainbow Commission. Um, it's an appointed a board that's appointed by our town manager. Um, and so one of the things we do is we look at town policies and procedures and um, what's going on in the school system uh, to look for ways to be more inclusive, uh, to be more welcoming, and to be um, a better community for the LGBTQ community. Um, for me, um, I'm, I'm, I've had a partner for 22 years. Um, she and I just got married this past year. Um, I'm kind of, um, I, I would say I, I hadn't really given a lot of thought to gender identity in, in the past because for me, um, I didn't have the language for it. And I was very much focused on just coming out as gay. So um, it, it, gender, it, I, I wouldn't say that I hadn't thought about gender identity because I have, but there, I didn't have a language for it. I didn't feel like there was a community for it. Um, but as, as things have changed over time, I'm really um, kind of looking at my own identity and, and I, I would consider myself non-binary. Um, but that's that's something that I think is pretty fluid. Um, and I think it's it's different for everybody. And I think everyone's at a different stage um, in, in their own process. Sure. And has has that has being a member of the LGBTQIA plus community impacted your birding experiences? Um, I would say in the past it has. Uh, things are definitely changing. Um, so I'd say 15, 20 years ago, there are certain places where um, I would not go out birding. I would not feel safe in the outdoors in certain locations. And I have been birding in places um, in the past where I have gotten comments um, that were very negative. Um, and so when I, when I was in AmeriCorps, and I mentioned I was in AmeriCorps earlier, I traveled quite a bit around the country. And so I had the opportunity to see sandhill cranes on the Platte River in Nebraska. And um, so I was, I was out and about a lot and out in the outdoors. And at that point in my life, things were, um, you know, this was the mid 90s. Things were different. Uh, there are definitely places where I didn't feel safe. Um, in, in places where I ran into trouble because of that. Um, I think where I am now, I'm in much more of an urban area. There's more of a language and um, an awareness and an understanding. I wouldn't say that it's perfect. It's definitely not there. Um, but I think um, things are better. Um, one thing I will say, and, and this is, I guess, true of being disabled. It's true of being part of the LGBTQ community. It's, um, I, I'm not BIPOC, but it, I, I would imagine that it, it's true of any marginalized community is that, um, especially bird clubs um, and, and more traditional birding arenas, is really important to um, foster more of a sense of safety and welcoming and inclusion and have that codified in, a, in like a, a mission statement or code of conduct and not just write it down and leave it there, but actually act in intentional ways that are inclusive and welcoming. And, and I think that's where we need to move the needle more. I think that's where we need more work is going from words to action. And, and I think we all play a part in that. Um, I know personally, there are some birding clubs where I would not feel comfortable um, and have not joined. Uh, there are other birding clubs, and I'll give a shout out to the Feminist Bird Club. I'm a member of the Feminist Bird Club in Boston. Um, that's, to me, a much more um, inclusive, welcoming, safe space. Yeah, right. Yeah. The, and the Feminist Bird Club, I'm such a fan of the Feminist Bird Club. Um, they do some amazing work and um, I know one thing that they do at the start is um, of, of outings, or at least the outing that I went on um, in Boston, the only one I've ever been on because then we moved away, but um, 
a welcoming statement at the beginning where they invited everyone to share their names and their pronouns, which can really help people feel more comfortable, um, especially if their pronouns don't match what other people might assume their pronouns are by their appearance. Um, and then um, th this idea of like co-leading um, and, and it really being intentional about creating a safe space. And I, I'm pretty sure there was something said at the start that if people weren't um, behaving well and, and inclusively that they'd be asked to leave. And I trusted that that would happen if something went not right. So yeah, like like you're saying, not just not just doing lip service, but actually being ready to to take an action if someone's making someone feel unsafe or saying things that are homophobic or transphobic or racist or sexist or or anything horrible, ableist. Um, yeah, being it's really uncomfortable, but it's really important. It's much, it's much more important. It, the discomfort that that the outing leader might feel having to be assertive like that is is much less than the the discomfort or the harm that may be caused to to someone hearing it. Um, there's there's some more ideas on our website too about inclusive organisations and about being a welcoming and inclusive birder. So um, if you're interested, folks, I'll, I'll get that link, those two links in the chat. Um, two more questions, Carrie, before we go into the Q and A. Um, thanks everyone for sending your questions in through that Q and A box. It's a lot easier for me to see them in there than in the chat. Um, um, do you have any tips and tricks for um, other autistic birders that you have discovered in your years of, of birding that, that help you go birding and, and enjoy birds? Um, I, I guess I'll start um, with um, people who are new to birding and, and just say that it's a really exciting and awesome hobby and there's so much to learn and it's going to be really, um, uh, I, I guess, I've lost my train of thought, I'm sorry, but I, I guess I, I just want to, um, I want to share my passion and, and I hope that um, any new birders who are autistic um, will see something in birding for them. Um, for me, I, I, can, I can see how it can go both ways um, for, for somebody who's autistic. And, and I, I guess I've had both of these experiences. On the one hand, um, if I want to be really serious about listing and about actually accurate, accurately capturing every single bird I see and counting, um, that could get pretty intense pretty quickly and become overwhelming. Um, on the other hand, um, it can be a really cool sensory experience just to listen to bird song or um, engage with birding in, in ways that, um, like if, if I've gone to banding demonstrations and volunteered a little bit with banding and to be able to actually um, hold a bird in your hand and and look and, and try to age the you know look the molt patterns and, and age the bird um, by by its feathers I mean that's that's something that um, is a sensory experience that you really can't replicate anywhere else so um, I think there's there's a lot of depth in birding and, and there's um, so much to explore that it's both um, like sense from a sensory sense it's it's really exciting and like um, a, a lot of autistic people when they're excited will flap their hands and, and that's kind of I, I can't put it in words but that's kind of like the feeling like um, and so yeah I, I, I don't think I can describe it well but I think other people other autistic people would recognize it um, yeah yeah but it's, it's important also to build in breaks um, because one of the other things that we do as autistic people is we have a really um, hyper focus. And, and sometimes, and, and I'm guilty of this too, where I forget to eat or I forget to go to the bathroom or I forget that it's really cold and I don't have gloves. And so it's, it's important also to plan ahead and kind of not lose yourself in the activity um, or go birding with someone so that um, you're kind of on track in terms of the things you need to do um, just to take care of you know, your daily needs. Um, the other thing I would say, um, this is something I've struggled with quite a bit, is um, going out in the field and going out in different conditions. Um, you, it's kind of important to have the right clothing or the right gear sometimes. 
um, or just know that like if you're going in an area where there are going to be ticks, for example, that you want to pull your socks up over your pants. But for some of these things, like they're they're kind of uncomfortable. Like I hate the feeling of pulling up socks over my pant cuffs. I absolutely hate it. And so just kind of like getting used to that ahead of time and how it feels and whether or not you can tolerate it, those sorts of things I think will be helpful for, for field outings. Um, and then just, I guess, reading um, about other people's experiences or gathering information. I know um, with, with autism comes a lot of anxiety. And I, I've mentioned this before about things that you might not have control over or can't change or surprises. And so um, this, this is true of, you know, helping an autistic person plan for an outing, but also for the autistic person themselves to really think about what you might need. Um, and like I said, I usually go scan out a location first ahead of time before I go out with a group, um, just to get a sense of what I personally might need or what might be triggering and what I need to be prepared for. Yeah, thank you. Really, really, really helpful um, tips and strategies. Thank you for sharing those. Um, again, if there's anyone um, in the audience who is autistic, um, there's a survey at the end when we finish this webinar and really love your, um, your feedback and your tips and strategies so that we can um, add this to, to our website so that more people can find this information if they're new to birding or if they're new to birding with an autistic birder or, um, or anything like that. So yeah, we'd love to hear your, your experiences and your, your tips and tricks. Um, I did notice a couple of comments in the chat about safety. Um, this is really important that we trust that someone who says they're feeling unsafe is unsafe and that we don't um, impose our own feelings of safety on someone else. Um, so if someone says they don't feel safe in an area, you don't, you don't even need to ask why. Um, maybe you could if you know them really well, but they're just feeling unsafe. That's the, that's the end of the that's the end of the discussion. Um, there's a I'm just sticking another link in the chat about uh, we have a question in the birdability site review that's the thing that populates the birdability map about potential safety concerns. And so um, the link I just put in the chat um, to a blog post about why we include that question. Um, and it doesn't really matter if you don't feel, if, if you feel completely safe, um, some people might not feel safe for a whole lot of different reasons um, in a place because of dogs off a lead or because there's a gun range next door or because um, there are hate symbols on the drive into that that property or whatever. So um, please have a have a read of that if you're if you're a bit confused or or a bit want a bit more information about safety um, in the outdoors. There's a lot of information too um, in different places. A lot of um, BIPOC birders have spoken about um, about feeling unsafe in different places as well. And 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 everyone um, surely has had experiences where they felt unsafe for all different kinds of reasons. So. Um, there's a little bit of information too there on, on that page about safety and birding on our website. And um, just because I mentioned BIPOC and safety, um, there's a page there about racism in birding too. So please have a look um, and just keep in mind that if someone says that they feel unsafe, that's all the information you need. Um, your experiences of safety in that place are not important in that when they tell you that they feel unsafe. Okay, Kerry, last thing before the Q&A, really quickly. I know that um, a lot of people who um, have disabilities and other health concerns get frustrated uh, when people ask invasive questions or say really inappropriate things. Um, many times it's well-meaning, they're just curious, but they're just totally off target and, and maybe they could go and Google it um, or it's just none of their business sometimes. Um, so, um, Karen and I spoke a bit about these before we before we went live today, and um, I actually I've had a little red flag to use as a visual reminder, but I don't have my red flag today. Instead, uh, I have a purple uh, <laughs> mat, which is not quite the same. But my my visual analogy was supposed to be that these are red flags. Don't do this, folks. This is not good. This is not okay. Um, these aren't so much questions today. They're, they're sort of statements, but um, this is not a thing that you should say to someone. You have autism. You're not autistic. That's a rude thing to say. Uh, we sort of covered that earlier, Carrie, about being able to identify however you want and that 
for you or being autistic is really important that people see up front. Um, another one that we, we talked about earlier too is why do you need captions? You're not deaf. Yeah, this is, this is something I get a lot. Um, pretty nearly every time I request closed captions as a reasonable accommodation, I, I get some version of this. And I think it's important for people to understand that there are many people with disabilities that use closed captions for many different reasons. It could be neurological, it could be cognitive, it could be um, deafness or hard of hearing. Um, but to assume that just one group of people needs closed captions is probably not accurate and dismisses the experience of people with many other kinds of access challenges. And, and similar to that safety thing, if someone says they need captions, like that should be all the information that you need to just turn the captions on. Truly, if, it, if it's just a click of a button, it's really not a thing that needs to be debated. Just do it, doesn't cause you any problems. Um, if you don't need the captions, you can turn them off for your screen, but they're still on for the people who need them. Um, and then um, here's another red flag thing with my purple, um, <laughs> not flag, <laughs> but, um, I know an autistic boy who doesn't speak. You do. You can't be that autistic. I, I get this a lot when I disclose as well, or again, some version of it, like you don't look autistic or you don't sound autistic or you're not as autistic as so-and-so's child. And um, I, uh, autism is a spectrum. It's, it's broad. Um, we, there's no one version of autism. And it's, as I mentioned earlier, is a dynamic disability. So on one day I might have access challenges that impact every activity I need to do. Um, another day I might have only some access needs. Um, another day I might be completely exhausted because I've expended all of my energy trying to meet access needs without accommodation. So it, it varies um, and, and I think this is why I think it's important that um, when the conversation is about autism, that we center autistic voices and center the experiences of autistic people, um, whether they be children who are using a AAC or alternative communication um, to communicate, or whether it's an adult that speaks, or whether it's someone that's selectively mute and only speaks part of the time, or whether it's someone typing or using text. Um, we do communicate, um, and, and I think it's important um, to take in what we're saying um, or to consider it, um, and yeah, I guess that's all I have to say about that, at least for now, but um, yeah, I mean, it, everyone's experience, every, every autistic's experience of autism is, is, is going to be a little different. Um, we all have a certain constellation of things that um, might be the same across the board or similar, um, and then we might have, you know, one, one thing that might be triggering for my sensory system may not be for someone else's, or one thing that doesn't bother someone else may really be a trigger for me, um, so it, it really depends. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And I just saw another comment that popped in that said, Carrie, thank you for sharing your world with us. Um, you've done a really beautiful job of explaining and thank you for, for all your, um, your teaching. Um, it's, it's been really wonderful to, to keep learning from you tonight. Um, there's some questions in the Q&A, so I'm gonna jump into those. Um, let's see. Um, do you process bird sounds differently than human speech? Um, I, I guess my response is I don't know. Um, because bird, bird sound is not a language that I've learned necessarily. I mean, I can identify calls after or songs after practicing. Um, generally, I'm I'm less good in the field than I would be if I listened to a recording when I'm in a quiet environment. 
So in that sense, yes, I'm, I'm slower to process, I'm slower to identify. Um, what's really, I, I guess, ties into this and what's really incredible is looking at a sonogram um, because then I have something visual. Um, and there's even um, tools out there where you can both look at a sonogram and listen to the song at the same time. And having that visual um, it really, really is um, a profound experience for me because it really helps me to understand um, the, the sensory and the sound experience. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's a great tip. Um, Merlin Bird ID is a free app that the Cornell Labo Ornithology has, and they now have a component in there where um, you can turn on the sound ID bit and it will have a sonogram going live. Um, and then it's, um, it's, then it tries to tell you what birds you're hearing, but you, even if you know what birds you're hearing, I'm just thinking of outing leaders um, could be using that or, or, or you Kerry could be using that live to be like, just, just to watch the sonogram, even if you, you know what you're hearing. Um, I know a lot of folks who are, de are deaf or hard of hearing find that information really helpful too, because it's a visual representation of, of what other people are, um, are hearing as well. Um, Speaking of the um, sounds at birding places, um, someone wrote, at birding sites, birders can be pretty chatty. Of course, they don't have captions when you're in person. So do you prefer birding at places where you can be alone? Um, I think, again, it depends. Um, sometimes there's value in birding with a group because you have more people who are making observations. So they might find something that you don't. And in, in that sense, it's, it's valuable. Um, you might have someone locate a bird um, that you didn't know was there or someone help you identify a bird that you were having challenges with. Um, so there's definitely, for me, there's value in birding with groups. The caveat for me is if it's a long outing, um, one of the things that I need really to, to center myself and if, if there are things that are triggering for me is to take a little space or to take a little time out um, to walk away from the group for a little bit. Um, birding, I, I think for me, birding absolutely alone can be tough. I'm usually going out with someone like one other person, maybe whether it's um, my partner or friend someone I know well um, because of something I mentioned before that I can entirely lose myself and forget to eat and forget that I need to put on gloves in this cold weather. Um, I, I definitely need for, for my own safety, I think I need to be out with at least one other person. Um, that said, you know, there's, there's definitely times where I really enjoy birding when it's super quiet. Um, and when it's like a, a place that's normally packed is empty. That's a great experience too, um, because it really helps me kind of tune in and um, pay closer attention. And, and that's really, that brings in kind of that mindfulness element um, that really helps me stay grounded. So it, it really depends. Um, where I live, um, a lot of our birding locations are very popular. Um, it's fairly urban. Um, in, in a lot of traffic, both in terms of people, but also a lot of the sites near where I am are, are quite small, um, like little parcels of conservation land. And so there can be roads and a lot of traffic around, um, and that can be super tough. Um, and that's the case where I have to kind of, kind of like balance, like, which is more important to me, like, wearing noise canceling headphones because I really can't stand that traffic noise or leaving them off on the chance that I might hear a bird that I really um, will enjoy experiencing. So that that is really a trade off for me. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, and thank you for mentioning that noise too. That's another question in the birdability site review because it can be the difference between a place being enjoyable and a place not being enjoyable for a bunch of different people for a bunch of different reasons. Um, speaking as a, about more sensory um, challenges, um, we have a question about, you, you mentioned clothing and pulling socks up over your pants and that that just feels so awful um, to you. Um, 
The question is, do you have a birding uniform or do you have any equipment or clothing you use that helps reduce that sensory input? I know you just mentioned headphones. Um, I found that toe socks, I found toe socks, um, the socks that have each individual like pocket kind of for each toe. Um, and it has changed my life. Interested if you have anything like that. I, I do. And, and more broadly, I have a uniform for everything. And it's usually like a hoodie and something soft and comfortable and cozy. Um, that said, when I'm preparing to go on a bird outing, um, yeah, I mean, my first priority is to stay warm or protected from the elements. And it's always going to be a trade off for me between what I want to wear and what I feel comfortable wearing and what I think I should wear or have to wear for the conditions. So um, I don't have a sensitivity to wool. And so I've found certain brands of wool socks that I really like and actually look forward to wearing. And, and so um, that has worked for me. I have a pair of hiking boots that are beyond dead and they're like 15 years old, but they're what works for me. And so the sole is falling off and the tread is flat and I'm wearing those boots. I, I just, they're irreplaceable to me. Um, and so sometimes I slip and slide and that's just a fact of life because I have to wear those boots. Um, yeah, I, I, one of the things for me is that things have to be very familiar. Um, so if I get something that's new, I'm going to have to get um, comfortable wearing it before I go out wearing it. Um, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And that's, it's trial and error, I think. Yeah, sure. I know um, lots of people, um, ev actually, in fact, everybody has some kind of sensory sensitivity. This is one of these really interesting things that a lot of neurotypical people might not realize, but, you know, people might be really, might really hate the tags on the back of their t-shirts or I really can't stand pumpkin and it's something about the texture in my mouth. Like, I just don't like that at all. Um, and I know like uh, even long sleeve t-shirts, I used to hate them because the, the seam around the cuff I could feel that rubbing on my wrist and it just drove me mad. But I've recently bought two long sleeve t-shirts that were a lot softer, a higher quality cotton. And I really love them now because I don't have to get sunburned on my arms. Um, I'll put sunscreen on, which I also hate the feeling of. <laughs> um, so yeah, sensory sensitivities are funky. What about, I know you said you take photos and um, you share them on Instagram, by the way, um, beautiful, beautiful photos of birds. Um, does, do you wear the camera strap around your neck? Because for me, it's so rough and like irritating on my neck. Like I don't want to wear that around my neck. I wear a binocular harness for the same reason, not, not the neck strap. Um, what, how, do you, how do you carry your, your camera and or binoculars? This has been a project for me <laughs> and a project that started with many meltdowns over a series of time. So it took a lot of things that didn't work to find something that did. Um, I, I do wear a harness for my binoculars and typically I'll put on the binoculars with the harness first. Um, I'll usually put them on, like stretch them out so that they're pretty loose. So they hang down a little lower. And then with the camera, I got a strap that I can wear crossbody. Um, the camera, so I did my research before I got this particular camera um, as I started to get more interested in photography. And so I did get a mirrorless camera because they're a little lighter than um, DSLRs. Um, and I had to try out a lot of different telephoto lenses um, before I could find one that I felt was light enough for me to carry in the field. Um, and with that, com that combination seems to work for me. I don't have the reach, um, I'm realizing for, um, uh, birds in the ocean or, or waterfowl in general, I'll say. Um, so I got a teleconverter, which is pretty lightweight, um, as opposed to a longer lens. So I'll attach that to the lens and give me a little bit more reach. Um, and then I realized this became really a project. 
Um, then I realized to get that extra reach, I would have to crop the photos as well. So it, it was kind of a multi-step process to really get that focal length that I needed to capture the birds I wanted to in the field. And it's a work in progress. So yeah, I, I had to find the lightest weight gear that I could comfortably carry and then um, carry it crossbody and have the binoculars also attached. But I, I'm looking into other types of harness systems, I think, for the camera that might work. So it's it's really a work in progress. If anyone has um, suggestions, that, that would be helpful too. Um, I'm just learning photography and I've found the online community, um, the birding community, really supportive. Um, you know, I've, I've asked questions in terms of um, particularly around editing photos. People are really helpful um, and have been really supportive. Um, and, you know, I'm very clear that I'm still learning. Um, and so, yeah, I found the online birding community in general pretty supportive, um, which is, I, I think, has um, been an asset for me because of a lot of social anxiety and shyness and not really wanting to engage with people a lot in person. Um, but online, I feel, uh, well, especially because it's written communication, I feel like I can gather more information and connect with more people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I know, I know a lot of folks um, with different disabilities and health concerns find the online dating community more accessible just because they maybe can't go out on organized outings, maybe because of a mobility challenge or, um, or another, another access challenge. And yeah, the online dating community is, is, can, can be like any community can be difficult and, and, but mostly I think can be really wonderful. Um, folks, if you're on Instagram, Carrie, is it all right if I share your Instagram yeah. handle? Um, Carrie's beautiful photos can be found at autistic underscore birda on Instagram. I just put that link in the chat, um, really gorgeous photos. And I used to live in Boston and, um, seeing her photos make me wish that I was back, back up there hanging out with purple sandpipers and, um, all the, all the Merganses. <laughs> um, one last question from the Q&A. Thanks everyone for sending these questions in too. Um, oh, and I did see a question about finding other birders, um, how to find other birders. Facebook, if you're on Facebook, there's lots of different state Facebook birding groups. Um, and, and there might be even more local, you know, within the state um, birding groups on Facebook. That can be a really great way to connect or just Googling um, bird clubs or there might be a state um, ornithological society or a nearby Audubon center or something and yes poke around on the internet because you you might be able to connect with other birders that way um, that can be a good way I, I my husband's in the army so we've moved a lot and that's often the way that I um, tap into the local birding community when we show up in an entirely new state um, the last question Kerry um, from the Q&A says would it be good to offer an option for people to let us know at registration you know prior to a, a bird outing or something if they have a disability or if they have questions about a specific need and I think that's a great question um and I would say yes and it might be phrased um something like if let us know if you have accommodation needs or access challenges or how can we best accommodate you um, but I think yes having a question of that nature is, is really great because it it both allows me to disclose ahead of time and um, express what what my um, access needs are, but it also is a signal that that organization is thinking about inclusion. And, and I think that second piece is actually more important um, because I'm going to gravitate towards programs or organizations that that are more inclusive that are asking those questions. Yeah, yeah. We we also um, encourage in that thing about the, the link I shared earlier about writing um, event descriptions. If if um, outing leaders can share their email address and invite actively invite people to ask them questions ahead of time if they want to know, you know, is the bathroom going to be open that day because I have irritable bowel syndrome, I need a bathroom or or whatever question. Like, not not forcing a potential participant to like dig out your email address, but actually saying up front, like, hey, ask me your questions. I'm here if you've got any questions. Um, another thing we do when we're holding um, accessible outings is 
inspired by that outing I went on with the Feminist Bird Club, um, the, the, the idea of in, having folks introduce themselves and share their names and their pronouns if they like. And um, the other thing I invite people to share is if they have an access challenge, which they, they think it would be helpful for other people to know about in that group. So if someone doesn't want to disclose, they don't have to, there's no pressure at all because you, 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 we're not saying you have to tell us, you know, it, it's just an, an invitation. For example, I have a dodgy knee. So I say, I'm going to sit down anytime there's a bench because especially if I'm leading the outing, it might look a little strange if I sit down all the time. But if I've told everyone, then I feel more comfortable just doing what I need to do to look after my body. Um, I know a lot of folks who um, have some kind of hearing loss will, will share, oh, actually, I, you know, I, I don't have any hearing in my right ear. Really helpful because that means if I'm going to go up and help them get on a bird, I'm going to stand on their left side. So it's helpful to them that I know this. But if it's not helpful for someone to know or you don't feel like disclosing, you don't have to. So that's another way to um, invite people to share what they need um, in, in this context. Yeah, I think you've made a lot of really great points, Freya. And, and I think for some people might feel comfortable disclosing ahead of time. And some people might um, have had negative experiences or traumatic experiences and may not feel comfortable disclosing. So I think for an orga organization that's trying to strike that balance, both have that question out there, like let us know about your access needs, um, but also try to anticipate, and I think this is the inclusionary aspect of it. Like you said, there's some people who have access challenges but may not identify as a person with a disability. Um, but if you're providing things proactively, they might be helpful to a larger group of people. So, um, you know, mention that the walk you're going on has benches or the trail you're going on has benches. That'll help your dodgy knee, but it doesn't mean that you have to disclose that. So, I think being thoughtful about the information you provide up front is, is really going to be helpful to a, a large group of people. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's, yeah, beautiful, beautifully said. Um, Kerry, thank you so much. Thank you so much for spending the last hour and a half um, sharing about your experiences and, um, and educating um, us and being such an amazing advocate for um, autistic folks and so many other people. You, you just, I think you're, you're wonderful. So thank you for, for everything that you've shared with me um, and with all of us today. Uh, I know, I know there's, there's been a lot of love in the chat. So um, it's, it's really, I'm really glad that, that you, you were uh, with us tonight. Um, our next um, interview, which will be on the Tuesday, the 1st of February, will be with Day Scott. I'm just putting the link in the chat if you want to register for that. Um, Day has a traumatic brain injury um, and we'll be talking a bit about life with a TBI and how that's impacted her birding and she's a photographer as well. So there's no doubt going to be more discussion about the photography um, in the context of disability. And um, yeah, so please register for that if you'd like. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, thanks again to the American Bird Conservancy and to our um, ASL interpreters and Carrie, thanks, thanks again so much. I, I look forward to getting back to Boston soon and going birding with you in person. I, I can't wait for that. Me too. And, and thank you so much for inviting me as a guest. This was really an honor and really humbling. And so I'm excited that I was able to reach a number of people through this webinar series. Thanks, everyone. Good night.